Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Thaya from Millennium IT, uh, part of Elzec Technology. Uh, I'm going to spend the next uh, 20 minutes of time talking about uh, heterogeneous computing trends and business value creation. Uh, of course, coincidentally, we're going to use the same analogies here, the Rubik's Cube. Um, so I'll, I'll take you through certain examples how it's being applied here. Uh, the former heterogeneous computing trends is uh, nothing new, but its application to capital markets technology had been uh, the subject of a lot of exploration and experimentation. So I'm going to share some of our experiences in using heterogeneous computing to our products at Millennium. And in that process, certain trends that we became aware of in, in the evolution of the technology. And uh, our view of the potential that heterogeneous computing has to offer for business value creation in the future. Um, so to begin with, a uh, bit of history that's uh, relevant to this topic. Let's imagine that in the late 90s, we are designing an exchange end-to-end -end trading system. It would have been a distributed architecture that's mapped to racks and racks of servers connected via, let's say, data center grade interconnects. And most of us would have, you know, enjoyed the benefits of successive generations of CPUs giving us a step jump in clock speeds, which meant that from a design point of view, the delta effort that we need to put into designs was minimal to reap the benefits. And there comes this transition somewhere around 2005, 2007, mid-2000s, the end of the frequency scaling uh, era, and then starts more energy efficient replication of cores. What, what that means to the designer is you have to face certain challenges. You are facing challenges in memory bottlenecks. You are facing a challenge in I.O. bottlenecks. And all that has to be incorporated with some investment in the designs. And successively, we had to invest more and more time in designs to re exploit the concurrency that we are talking of here. So, Inevitably, we have got into a world of parallel programming. And uh, as we go deeper, the CPU is just one candidate that probably it's, it's familiar territory to us, where it's optimized for control-centric tasks. And we could run such tasks in parallel in a multi-core system. There are other architectures that have, been, that have found their way into mainstream computing from a probably a use case or a domain specific application. So there are two technologies that I'm going to take which has been quite uh, popular. One is the GPU from the gaming and the graphics world, and then FPGAs from more electronics, uh, telco kind of background, reconfigurable digital systems. Uh, so the thing that I want to emphasize here is each of these architectures have been optimized for a certain class of problems, and they've been evolving. So in the lack of a definition of a problem, there's clearly no winner here. And if you have a big enough problem that can be partitioned so that you could map it to these different technologies, probably there's a lot of scope for the designer to try out various things. And when you think of bringing such a heterogeneous system to partition your larger problem, let's say for argument's sake, building an exchange system, and trying to map it to these different technologies, inevitably there's one more variable, which is the interconnects. And the limitations of the interconnects would spell out what is viable and what's not, practically. So I want to stress two influences at this point in time uh, that pretty much shapes this uh, technologies and the interconnects. So the ultimate, probably uh, common indicator of capacity is fabrication technology, regardless of all these processes. So if you look at fabrication technology, it's quite interesting here. We have gains, or to be more specific, we have diminishing gains with time. And over the last decade, we also have these differences between these processes narrowing down eventually to a point where you know, we hit parity on fabrication technology. It's a good thing. There are more transistors at disposal, but it means different things to different processes. 
Now, to take it a step further, if you look at CPUs, it was a case of you bring in, you're able to bring in more cores, you have die space, so you can bring in uh, integrated memory controllers, integrated I.O. controllers, integrated graphics. But for the case of GPUs, if you look at that, it has transitioned across multiple models of programming. It has transitioned across multiple languages, and we have high-level abstraction languages today. And it also has a rich set of libraries to use now, supported by a community, perhaps. And for the FPGA, it's a similar story. I mean, you have hardened IPs, you have soft IPs. And the concept of system on chip on FPGA is becoming more relevant now because of the space, the real estate that's made available. So essentially, it has been a transformation, but it was mainly focusing on scaling and efficiency for the CPUs, whereas for the GPU and the FPGA, it's not just scaling. In addition to that, we have seen improvements in tooling. We have seen a lot of IP that's being generated. We are seeing a community that's forming. So there's a lot of transformational stuff that has happened. So despite the fabrication, it's important to start realizing these technologies. We need to have the infrastructure in place. We have an existing infrastructure that is evolving, that's scaling up. But we are creating a workable infrastructure for a complex project for accelerators to be of use. The next influence is certainly interconnects. This diagram is not the recent of its kind, but suffices to show the trend of ever increasing bandwidth. So this axis is bandwidth. But you know, with time, with all these improvements, we actually hit a wall on latency. So if you look at multiple process elements, it's all connected via some uh, peripheral interconnect. And PCI, as we know, I mean, has been very familiar. It's, it's, it's the standard interconnect we have with widespread use. It doubles in its bandwidth generation after generation. But in terms of latency, we are pretty much cornered there, I would rather say. So these two influences actually bring us to where we are today. Uh, so the problem moves away from the choice of a technology to a problem, a challenge, where it's for the designer to figure out how to partition your design to make the best use of the architectures. So it's essentially about you know, playing around with different pieces of the system. So in a nutshell, for the designer, there's been a transition like this, a distributed architecture that, that becomes a somewhat dense, homogeneous, and distributed architecture with the advent of multi-core GPUs. And then that goes through a transformation technologically to map it to a heterogeneous and distributed architecture. Now in this analogy, I'm, I'm relating the white boxes here to the latencies or the, or the inefficiencies of interconnects. So you can't make these boxes, colored boxes, any closer than this, given the current situation. And we certainly have challenges. The designer has a lot of challenges here. I won't go through these challenges because these are obvious. I would like to emphasize points two and three, inefficient boundaries. And as a result, we can only map the problem in a coarse-grained fashion, we can partition it in a coarse-grained fashion. As a result, you have to hit certain compromises. A GPU can never always run data parallel applications. It has to, at times, do a bit of control flow as well. Similar case for FPGAs. And certain compromises have to be met. The big question, heterogeneous approach, can it be a differentiator, or is it really an unnecessary killer at this point in time? Now, to answer this question, I mean, it, this cannot be answered by looking at technology and designs, obviously. I mean, the answer to this question has to come from the context of value creation. So we believe it can be a serious differentiator. And we see that happening in two stages. Uh, the diagram on the left, so it, it explains, it, that shows, let's say, the current situation on the base case of using a legacy technology to an existing business model. And the more trivial or standard step from that point is to try and use heterogeneous computing to existing business models, what happens then? 
probably we unconstrain the business models with heterogeneous computing so that the unrealized potential of the current business model leads to value creation. So you could realize there had been a region like this where business models had been constrained by available technology. And what does heterogeneous computing do? It actually helps realize that extra potential in the existing business models, kind of an enhancement. The second step is more uh, challenging and, and interesting, is you transform business models appropriately to unlock the unrealized potential that heterogeneous computing can offer to your systems, finally creating value. So that brings another region of suboptimality to, to the picture, which is technology being constrained by business models. Now this is quite relevant to the situation that most of us, or in general, the industry is in. The first step had been very you know, obvious. Somewhat it could be considered an arms race of using a technology to the existing business model, because there's no end to it. But this transformation essentially is very crucial to fill or take this up to this point. And this is probably the sweet spot where we all want to be in. And we see that happening in finer steps, like this. The lower two layers correspond to the enhancement, the upper two layers for the transformation. Uh, let me give you some examples. I will not go into details. There's so many possibilities. I'll give some examples that we have been exposed to. So at the lowest two levels, probably you bring heterogeneous computing to an existing business model you most probably expect something like this. You either have a predictably high performance system. It gives you some efficiency in the form of space, probably, for that performance, or in the form of energy. Uh, or sometimes it gives you so much of an order of magnitude high headroom to operate so that you could functionally enhance your business model for the same level of performance. So these, one of these two kinds, or a mix of that can happen. So here's just an example that we have been um, working for LSEG, which is a real-time market data system. I think it's quite the usual case for hardware accelerators, where you get uh, a predictably high performance, and you get these benefits of within the realms of the current business model by applying heterogeneous computing. So before I go to the upper two layers, let me slightly go back to the drawing board with regards to the design. Now there's another trend that's unfolding, which is right now happening, and we see that happening in the future as well, which is convergence of all these processor elements for more fine-grained heterogeneous computing systems. So this is again going back and referring to the problem of inefficient boundaries, and there's a lot of work that's happening right there. So I'll, I'll just put, I'll, I'll display some of the changes that are happening. I'll not go into details. So it's centered around better scaling of accelerators, or it's either centered around reducing the communication barriers between these process elements, or it could be that your mode of synchronization has been made so efficient that you can switch between these processors at the granularity that you want. What does that mean to the designer is, once this thing happens, as this unfolds into the future, you have a coarse grain mapping to a heterogeneous system. Suddenly your system has the capability to handle minute tasks. So you can't still retain the same designs and expect this to be optimal. There has to be a transformation that happens where you can actually design your system in a way so that you can find this optimal solution at a fine-grained modular level and apply it to your problem. So this is certainly a challenge for the designer because this, in other words, is a design space explosion, I would say. There are many combinations, many possibilities. How do you handle this? How do you upfront decide that the best combination of technology and modules for your problem? Here are some examples of how we plan to tackle this. This is ongoing uh, work uh, that 
we've been doing. Essentially, it starts with actually defining a problem in a, in a fine-grained modular design, an actor-based design or whatever. And it also means you should be able to run these on multiple processor platforms and be able to swap between these platforms in a dynamic late mapping fashion because you don't take the decision at the time of designing. And it certainly has to be user schedule because sh the problem of scheduling is heavily shaded by the business problem, the requirement in here. And you need probably a high level domain specific language to abstract the problem and the implementation, decouple it away so that you can define a system and then realize many implementations like this. So I won't spend time since we're pressed for time. This could enable paradigm shifts like this. Brute force solutions can become possible in real time. You can have you know, emerging data feeding into your system, still take decisions on the fly, deep learning. And here's some examples of possible business model transformation as a result of this. So one thing that I think we've been working on is a real-time risk and margin portfolio optimization. A self-healing system, probably from operations point of view, can transform your business model. And this is one example of a domain-specific language that's being applied to the post-trade system. So this is, this is just a summary of the kind of evolution that's happening and the need for business model transformation to realize the full potential. Um, so that brings my presentation to an end. I'm open for questions, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah. Your presentation was mostly about uh, increasing. Uh, uh, your presentation was mostly about increasing uh, compute, uh, computing uh, power, uh, but in real system, uh, you have to work. Uh, with data, uh, and uh, do you have any um, probably numbers or something? How because uh, uh, um, uh, probably you are actually limited with uh, database solutions because they uh, uh, doesn't um, uh, increase uh, speed that much. But um, uh, technologies you're talking about, uh, so how it plays in real life uh, when you have to deal with uh, data. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so in the case of a, a system like, let's say for argument's sake, a risk, real-time risk system, uh, the notion of real-time is quite subjective. Because what we consider real-time in a post-trade world versus what we consider real-time in pre-trade or market data could be entirely different. I mean, some orders of magnitude different. So what we essentially mean by saying systems become faster is a visible outcome of using heterogeneous computing. But just because some part of the system became super fast over time and it competes for latency and throughput is not going to really make our systems create the required value differential, let's say, compared to the effort that we are putting. So you're, you're, to answer your question specifically, now databases come into the picture because you have some regulatory requirements to, to take a snapshot of every computation that you do. Let's say you have a super fast risk system that responds to market data. You cannot use a database architecture as of now. Probably how do we overcome that? We need to negotiate with the regulators or we need to find a way of, of retaining the required information still efficiently. Now, Clearly, I see one example. You could do real-time risk, and you could bring the outcome to a pre-trade system where you do validation based on actual portfolio monitoring in real time. There is some value in a business, not for regulatory purpose or anything like that. So it's a spectrum. I, I think this is an area of exploration, so I would rather say it's an area where technologists, designers, uh, people who define business models and regulators need to work together. And there's a lot of uh, scope for it, even beyond the organization in the case of regulators. We need to rethink our models, and, and then only we can unconstrain the limitations that we have imposed to technology as a result of our existing models. Did I, I don't know if I <laughs> specifically answered your question. Yes, thank you. Thanks. 
Um, hello. Uh, do you think that industry needs some uh, language or technology like, for example, Java 20 years ago allowed us a uh, program on one system and it ran against our system? Do we need the same technology now, for example, to write it once and run it on GPU, on FPGA, on core yeah. CPUs? Yeah. And uh, do, you f uh, do you expect something that it's already I a think, market? Or yeah, yeah. So um, I think it's quite a natural expectation to unify the programming approach. So we know it's happening right now. So if you take, for example, OpenCL is, is an open community-based language for accelerators in general. Uh, but it again comes down to the value that your heterogeneous system brings into the picture. And we've been using CPU-based architectures for quite some time. So if we are to get the expected value out of the system, I would rather say the maturity of these platforms right now is still not yet up to the mark. But probably with time, because again, compilers and tools are again part of the technology. So whatever benefits that come here, you could have a compiler that can heuristically run a system, get parameters, fine-tune the mapping to different processors and hide all that information probably in, in some time in the future. If that happens, yes, we, we might be having a system. I'm sure there's a lot of research going on there, but I think the current situation still uh, makes it counter the original purpose for which we are bringing a heterogeneous computing system in. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, we're